welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm joined today by Muhi Kawaja, CFRE from Fundraising Academy, one of the amazing trainers over there. Muhi, welcome back, my friend. Thank you so much, Julia. Pleasure to be on. Oh my gosh, I always love having you on. But the first thing that I love more than anything is is playing a little bit of Carmen San Diego. Where in the world is Muhi Kwaja? Where are you coming to us <laughs> from today? Uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Amazing, amazing. Well, it looks like you're just next door to us and um, we could not be more thrilled. And so I say, let's get this show on the road. We've got so much to talk about. A um, lot of interesting questions this week. And if you're not familiar with Ask and Answer, um, folks can write us, stop us on the street, call us, text us, go through any of our social platforms and ask questions that they they need to have answered. Sometimes they're anonymous. Sometimes we make them anonymous <laughs> uh, because we want to protect their identity. But um, it's always an interesting time. Muhi Kawaja, um, is brings to us like many of the other folks from Fundraising Academy, a, a wide assortment of talents. And as the co-founder of American Muslim Community Foundation, um, we go to Muhi on some other issues of leadership. And it's really been a, a pleasure, Muhi, to have you with us as we journey forward. So um, pleasure is I, mine. I, I, I just want to say, I think we got the memo on the wardrobe, black and white, so, you know, we at did. least that's, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretending that I'm with you in spirit because you were just yeah. in Peru. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm here. I should be with you doing this room up remotely. Anywhere there's internet. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, over the last couple of months, we've been um, introducing our new co-host panel. They come from all over the country. They're uh, in incredibly diverse group of people um, in terms of how they work, how they think, where they're located. And uh, so I hope you get to know them and meet them uh, as we move forward, because they're really an amazing, um, illustrious group of people. Another thing that's really, really important to us are our partners and our, our supporting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Tech Talk, and JMT Consulting. Okay, Muhi, big question, big question. And um, I'm going to be honest with you. I took the, the names off and I took this the community off because I didn't want this to kind of cause a problem. And the question is this. I have a sticky situation on my hands. I was recently with my CEO. She made a presentation to a community group. She used data that was out of date and relayed information about our nonprofit that was flat out incorrect. How do we get us all on the same page when it comes to telling the story of our organization? Interesting, huh? Very interesting. Uh, and it, I've seen this happen when people are longer standing in an organization. Maybe they haven't uh, run the numbers recently. They're memorized old information, or even if they practiced the new information, they are just used to the old information when they're sharing the story, right? Yeah. So I think what is helpful here, if you have a marketing department, have them create the talking points have them update the literature around impact uh, and share that to the board, leadership, staff, everybody is on the same page. And there should be a pitch deck that is regularly updated with these statistics, whether it's on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, annual basis, so that you're all speaking the same language. Uh, I know it was so important at the American Red Cross when we had deliverables to share in the stewardship report, what numbers were we sharing with our donors who had supported that initiative? So we would work closely with our marketing department and they would even break it down on a regional basis, on a chapter basis, on a national basis, how many people we served. Um, so all of those numbers can look differently 
but make sure that you're using the same source of data to tell your story. You know, I love that you said this, and I, I'm also, um, I, I want to ask you more about the, the, I would call it, like, I don't think you use the word pitch deck, but the deck. Um, it seems to me that if this CEO or any member of the team was making, um, you know, was working in a community presentation environment, like maybe they're talking to a Rotary Club or a Kiwanis Club, mm -hmm. and, and there would be that AV kind of opportunity. Um, are you seeing that enough where where an organization will be like, if you're going to go out in the public, here's the deck and here's the information and how here's how to, to navigate this? Or do you see that used enough? I don't. Uh yeah, I think sharing it publicly even ahead of time is totally good. You want to have those uh, marketing assets readily available, maybe as a leave behind. Um, and you can always follow up in this case, like, you know, I've done presentations where for American Muslim Community Foundation, I've said we've had Tony endowments. And then we had somebody come back and say, well, on your website, you only list 19. Um, so like, you know, a very small thing like that, or if it is something that's outdated information, you can do a leave behind with the group you presented to and say, here's a more updated presentation with accurate information. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't need to say like our CEO told you incorrect facts, like be politically correct about it and just say, here's updated information. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think as an electronic leave behind or as a follow-up over an email with whoever you presented to, definitely sharing the details that you have with updated information is a good play. Yeah. You know, I think the other thing too is that um, you said something interesting as well, and that is, you know, the aspect of somebody who's been with an organization a long time and, and maybe they have their dog and pony show, you know, ingrained into them. And mm -hmm. so, um, it's it's easier to be a little um, inaccurate, right? Not that it's malicious, but um, I also think too that this remind this question reminded me of the importance of bringing our teams up to date with the most accurate information. Absolutely. Right? You know, so often we we're working through what we got to do. We're working our work, right? And we don't step back and say, okay, everybody, let's focus in on these three key metrics or, you know, yeah. when we meet with somebody, these are our top three things or whatever. Um, and so that struck me because I don't care if you're, you know, working as a day porter on the campus or the receptionist, everybody's got to be saying the same thing, using the same numbers. And so I found that just fascinating and, um, really a great reminder this is an interesting question in that it's never come in before and um but yet i've got to believe there there are very few organizations that haven't experienced this and so thank you so much to having that come in there's a chance that we might have lost muhi um so let's go ahead and go to our next question and tackle that and let's see the question comes to us um, here comes Mui back in. Let's go ahead and, and add him back in here. Apologies. Uh, the one That's thing I was going to say again um, to that last point was um, it reminds me how often are we going back to our strategic plan? Are we looking at the information, the KPIs? Are we assessing them, monitoring them monthly, quarterly, and sharing it back out to the team? Uh, so those are all things that I think tie together. Yeah, absolutely. No, and it, it's it seems monotonous, but but to your point, we need to be coming back and we need to be getting everybody on that same track because this isn't that that last question was a fascinating example of how easy it is, you know, to get misaligned and then it it creates other problems, right? Doesn't doesn't make the, everybody look so sharp. So Mindy comes to us from another city with health and Mindy writes, "I'm a CEO of a nonprofit and I have a board member who, who I think would be fabulous in asking situations. How should I navigate this with my development department? They don't seem keen on having outside folks attend their meetings. This board member is so passionate and, uh, and a true believer in our program. So this is an interesting question because 
it seems to me like the development department or development team has their own process. They have their own cadence. They, they're comfortable with working, you know, in a team with donors. And then here's this outside voice. What do you say about this? Well, first of all, I'm really glad that I'm getting this question. Uh, okay. Second of all, I'm curious why they think a board member is outside folks. They're a pertinent part of your organization. Mm -hmm. And every nonprofit would do so much better if their boards were integrated into fundraising. I can't stress that enough. And if this CEO thinks that there is a board member who can help with fundraising, they're doing their job. So I don't see why there's a disconnect between the CEO and the development department, but that's exactly what a CEO should be doing is cultivating their board to be part of fundraising and owning that relationship with the board for the development department. The development department should have somebody on staff that is working closely with the CEO to engage the board. I'm sure you're nonprofit wants to have a hundred percent board giving and part of that process for the board giving is for them to look into their portfolio create warm leads and also be part of the ask if that is a skill set that they have uh, mm -hmm. so i'm all in favor for integrating the board into development measures and in a calculated way mm -hmm. i myself i've talked about this before I ask the uh, board members to have a mini portfolio, 10 to 15 contacts of their own personal friends who give to the organization, or maybe somebody who lives in their zip code uh, for a personal touch. Uh, so I can't speak more about this than, than that. So, you know, to me, this almost dovetails with the first question in that um, a board member who has a lot of passion and can, you know, who's a leader in the community and can, you know, for lack of a better word, behave in the ask situation, might not always be armed with the same information. And, and, um, and maybe, you know, that could be a part of the, the sense of, oh, you know, they're a loose cannon and I don't know what they're going to say. But mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think the board members, first of all, the board members need to know how this system works. Yeah. That you don't just pick up a phone and dial for dollars, right? They need to know how the relationship process works. And I, I think that's, you know, something that is woefully missing in a lot of boards. They don't really understand the fundraising component. Um, but I agree with you. I think a passionate um, voice, especially somebody who's a volunteer, you know? Yeah, and a second point, uh, that I'd like to make around this as well is the board should have a development committee and maybe that's the best place for them to be in meetings, but there should be a development representative on that board committee, whether it's the CEO, the chief development officer, if the development team is only one person, it's that person. Uh, but think of ways in how the development department can provide success to the board to be engaged in fundraising. And what are those ways? Are they making follow-up thank you calls, writing thank you notes? Uh, are they participating in um, grant foundation meetings because they have a connection there? Are they uh, telling the beneficiary story, a mission moment? How are they integrated on a donor visit? These are all ways in which board members can play a role. Mm -hmm. I I love that you you said that because I think that that gives uh, a better picture to what that role looks like and what it should look like and what it can look like, right? As opposed to just showing up once a month or once a quarter and and listening to reports, it it puts them more yeah. in in the center of the action. Yeah, thank you, Muhi. I think that was a really interesting question. Um, let's go to Pat from Flagstaff, Arizona. Now, this was directly written to you. Muhi, you seem to be flourishing with a WFA structure, work from anywhere. We're trying to expand our team, which means some would be in different time zones. 
What platforms and procedures are you using to make it all work? Yeah, I love this question, Pat, and thank you for reaching out for me specifically on this. I think a work from anywhere structure is just 2024. Like if you are able to have a team that works well, that has regularly scheduled team meetings, department meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, and there are a few time zones away, it's totally fine. Like right now, Buenos Aires is uh, hour past New York time. So it's a little bit different than my normal work schedule, but I have Pacific standard time meetings. I have East Coast standard time meetings. So I'm all over the place, but as they say, my calendar is running my life. So when something gets plugged in, I'm behind a screen and I'm logged in and I am focused on that task. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as platforms and things that go, you know, if you are tracking time in Gusto, you can track your time there. Uh, our teams use Microsoft Teams. I have other teams that use Slack just to have that um, engagement anytime. Um, I use Calendly to block off certain times and dates where people can schedule meetings with me. Um, so I always make myself available to a client, to a team member, internally, externally, at times that work for my schedule. Uh, so yeah, I'm also um, traveling, but I'm working and traveling. I'm not on vacation, right? So it's very different. Right. Um, but sure, I might go see a tour at, you know, 3 p.m. and enjoy something in the city. But I've scheduled my work schedule around that and to make sure I still maintain my hours and complete deadlines and work on things. Um, and it ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'm super productive in a three hour time frame and other times it takes me three days to complete something and that is just, I think, common amongst people who work remotely and in an office. Um, you know, there's more water cooler time in an office and you don't have less of that. You don't have a commute. You don't have all of these things that add up time that uh, in an eight hour workday, you're maybe only working five and a half, six hours anyways. Um, but in a work from anywhere situation, I'm still maximizing those eight hours. Um, so. I think that if you have the flexibility to move your department or your team or your entire organization to a remote structure with maybe two in-person meetings a month or one in-person meeting a month or a quarter, whatever you yeah. think works for your team, find that cadence. I'm a huge proponent of it and let people live their lives. Mm -hmm. Well, I got a witness. I mean, I, I communicate with you through email um, mm -hmm. quite a bit and it's immediate. I, I never <laughs> ever feel like, um, you know, uh, knowing that you might be out of the country or wherever mm -hmm. you are, because we don't work off the same time zone, even when you right. are right. here in the U.S. But um, I, I don't see that you're not here just down the street, right? I mean, yeah. it seems to me like when, when we communicate and when we work together, it's uh, seamless. So, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. And, you know, for those of you familiar with Flagstaff or maybe you're not, it's a it's a remote community in northern Arizona and um, they don't have a huge population. So the reality is if you're trying to build your team, you're going to have to be, you know, looking at a WFA Widespread, situation yeah. because you you don't have, you know, that the luxury of that giant population to draw from. So very mm -hmm. interesting. And and I, I love that uh, we could have this discussion with you while you are in South America. I mean, that's just fabulous. Really, really is. Okay. Let's go to the next question that is come um, to us from Robert in Omaha, Nebraska. And he writes, this is again, very interesting. We do not have a designated quote unquote next up board chair. I believe this position would be called board chair elect. How essential is this for us to have and should it be reflected in our bylaws? I'm not sure how to proceed with this as I think it 
would help us a lot, but in other ways undermines our structure. Wow. Yeah, this is a really interesting question. And I would love to hear more, Robert, about why you feel it would undermine your structure. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I know Association of Fundraising Professionals, AFP, they implement uh, vice chair elect, chair elect, mm -hmm. other positions in committee elect. So they're very yeah. in tandem of training the elect person how it is done. So AFP often has like a two year commitment, one as the elect and then one as the position itself, which I think is fantastic if you have that many members and you can fill in the spots. And, you know, I've sat on boards, I have managed boards for organizations that I'm part of. I could see the benefit of an elect position, especially for uh, positions like president, vice president, treasurer, uh, even secretary, just so that you know how things work. Uh, and I think there's value if you are going to implement it as a new policy uh, within your organization, you should definitely update your bylaws. And I think these types of documents like bylaws and others should be looked at annually, uh, maybe at your board strategic planning retreat or at a different annual meeting that takes place and looks at all internal documents, just so that you're regularly reviewing them. You can make sure things are up to date uh, and keep things organized. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think you need to have that next up. And that doesn't mean that it's always going to work, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be yeah. that, you know, you, you have to find another one, but I think it's a lot safer um, in, in terms of building continuity for the organization, because then that person right, right. will know what the cadence is, you know, um, what the processes are, what the policies are. And I do believe in my experience movie is that when you do have those, you know, elect positions, I think those people sit up a little bit straighter in the meetings, meaning that they're kind of like, okay, this is going to be mm -hmm. me. I better, you know, be paying attention and, and uh, figuring this out for continuity purposes. So I think it, it's it's a good way to manage an organization, and I, I think you shouldn't be afraid of it. I also appreciate, Mui, that you said designate this um, as a policy in mm -hmm. your bylaws. Um, I think that's a smart a smart call. I really do. I think it's really, yeah, really and good. There should be job descriptions. What's the difference between mm -hmm. elect and the regular position? Mm -hmm. It's about mind share. It's about brain trust. It's mm -hmm. about institutional knowledge and continuity. Uh, so I really support this. Yeah, good. Well, you know, we need to be thinking about this too. When we think about 1.8 million registered nonprofits yeah. in this country, you know, that's a heck of a lot of board activity. Mm -hmm. And and you are competing for that as an organization, right? Because in your in your average community, there are going to be a lot of other options for, for uh, volunteer board members to participate in. And so you got to make sure that you're, you know, in line with um, attracting the, the best, the most qualified and the most, you know, um, committed board members, you know, and, and so I think mm -hmm. that's really, really important. Well, Muhi, again, always a delight to have you come and join us on Ask and Answer um, with us on Fridays. It's a lot of fun. I, I always love your, um, your perspective and, and the things that you talk about, which I think you always give us good advice that's achievable and logical. And, and so it kind of, it helps strengthen our organizations um, from all these different levels. So Muhi Kawaja, CFRE trainer at Fundraising Academy, really an interesting human being as the co-founder of the American Muslim Community Foundation. Muhi does a lot of different types of work helping our communities in the nonprofit sector. You can check out fundraising-academy.org and you will learn all of the different trainings and information that they have. The amazing thing about this is that even though it's part of National University, there is just a vast swath of free content and training materials that, uh, Mui, I say this all the time to you and your team, if I had been introduced to this as a young community member, um, back in the day, I would have raised millions more in my community. Mm. I, I know that for a fact because it's a, a 
cause selling approach that's very logical, that's very achievable. And it just is so brilliant. It's very simple in its approach, but what's wonderful about it is that it's a system. And so I think it just keeps everybody on track. And I, I lament that I didn't have you all in my life 30, 40 years ago when I started. Doing well, we're here for you now. We're here for everyone else. Uh, there's free monthly webinars. There's an online learning portal with all the past historical information, a lot of CFRE credits that you can earn, um, and so much more. So definitely do check out fundraising-academy.org. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, before we let you go, um, you and our other favorite friend um, from Fundraising Academy, Jack Alato, have been involved in a... Um, in a CFRE training yeah. module. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we launched the first Muslim CFRE study group with American Muslim Community Foundation. We did it in partnership with CFRE, with AFP Global. Uh, we had about 30 fundraisers sign up and it just wrapped up earlier in June. So we were super excited to have that. We have several more Muslim fundraisers who've signed up for their CFRE before the end of the year. So we're happy to see their success and root them on. Um, and yeah, we just want to be more strategic with professional development opportunities and make sure that um, Muslim fundraisers are actively participating in these best practices as well. I love it. I think that's great. I think the two of you are so dynamic and bring a uh, so much to the table. I've got to believe that those sessions were really interesting and certainly one of a kind. Um, do you have plans for, for building another cohort down the path? We'd love to. I think we can try to commit to doing it once a year at the current capacity that we have. But the great thing, mm -hmm. everybody who taught a section was a Muslim CFRE. Uh, mm -hmm. So each segment had somebody and now we can expand on that as we have more CFREs and have them teach more sections. So yeah. definitely. Love it. I think that's great. Well, kudos to you uh, too for, you know, joining up and, and recognizing this is, is an action to take uh, because, you know, we talk about this a lot and you and I have even chatted about this privately. And that is that, you know, when we educate up our, our sector, everyone wins. Everyone wins. Hundred percent. You know, we just need to keep, you know, uh, building that that institutional knowledge, and um, and demand of professionalism. So really cool. Well, again, I've always loved my time with you, Muhi. I always learn something new, and you always inspire me. Another thing that inspires me are all of our presenting sponsors. Oh, I love the heart. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, our sponsors include Blue Meringue, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that really make a difference in our world and in your world as well. Mui, as we end every episode, we like to end in, a, in the week as well, since we're talking with you on a Friday and the message goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Thank you, Muhi.